that I will be speaking in the place where Fidel Castro has made a lot of uh, speeches. So I would like to invite you, all of you to make pictures of yourself in this place. It's very memorable. I can imagine that uh, back in the 60s and 70s, most of the students loved his concept because it just fits to the students' revolution and uh, independence uh, philosophy. A lot of people have put a lot of respect to him. And up till today, uh, Cuba is referenced as the rebel place in the world. And I think it's good to have such a disruptive uh, place in this thing. I'm going to be light in my little talk, you know, to tell you what's, how the internet has uh, started. Um, so, so if you think uh, that you have invented the internet, I would like to maybe correct this. There was a little thing called, um, you know, spider, a couple of millions years ago, if not uh, over a billion years ago, this planet used to be basically uh, belonging to them. So you can imagine that little small piece of a creature saw flying food and said, oh, how can I catch this food? You know, even the human being, it took it a lot of time you know, to, to think about you know, creating a gun you know, to get down this flying food and produce the first net, which is basically what, or the first web, which, which is what we have today as the symbolic thing for the internet. Uh, this study has been done by NASA uh, in order to see what is the immediate impact if you, um, let's say, expose this kind of little uh, creature on, uh, on different materials. So the first one is they sprayed caffeine on, the, um, uh, on this uh, spider and it started losing its uh, genetically, you know, web design. So uh, if you are a coffee drinker, uh, I would recommend that you maybe check on the number of coffee as well as on your genetic um, uh, 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 attitude in drinking too much coffee. So this is not a thing to um, oversee. The next one, they sprayed marijuana on it and it started losing totally the, the, its uh, own design. And this is where I start to compare it to the internet when we introduced uh, this famous thing called NAT. So we have marijuana NAT on the internet, uh, which is uh, basically derailing the internet from the peer-to-peer -peer into a telecom internet. And it's there where we have to maybe to focus on it. And some people have been quite smart you know, to create kind of an end-to-end -end concept uh, using STUN and those uh, technologies. So the little beast is stunned as such. So, so, so basically, we, we have gone from internet to internet. And we don't have an internet. We have uh, basically a, net, a network of uh, networks. Uh, and this is really destroying the best thing that uh, the human being, from an open source perspective, has created. And I think we need to restore this uh, immediately. Now, uh, I'm going to go through some generations. Not only the internet has its own generation, but some other things as well. So, um, and it's, it comes down to the simplest thing that people understand, which is the addressing. So NCP had two power 28, uh, power, to the power of eight, so that 256 computers. And basically, back in, 70, uh, in 1972, the address space was gone of NCP. So, so the discussion was to invent something new. And then in 72 as well, Vince Bob Khan designed the TCP IP, but it took them about two decades you know, to get it done. And I'll show you how this thing has, uh, has come to, uh, to life. And even with V6, uh, it's only when Al Gore opened NSFNet. This is why you know, he mentioned himself as the inventor of the internet. But it is really a, a good credit to him that he has done so. And it basically uh, opened the discussion to create the new version of V6 or whatever, V7, V8, V9, there were four contenders. And, uh, and that uh, created a new impetus in order to have a look at the internet from a clean slate point of view, hence uh, the design of IPv6. And uh, in between, basically from an IPv4 uh, time, we had the first losers, so all those that were against IP, so the SNA, DECnet, and uh, Novel IP, uh, IPX, although Novel was a very good one, especially the auto configuration, was, which was quite uh, interesting in IPsec, uh, IPX. 
uh, which was adopted in IPv6. That's why we have the auto configuration, which is a very important thing. And then uh, we had the OSI world, even the ITF uh, uh, IB wanted to have OSI as the next thing instead of IPv6. So hence, uh, there was a, a reshuffle of the IAB and, and then the introduction of the ISG in order to have a kind of um, you know, safe harbor, not that some small group is going to decide on the new internet generation. And C CNP was driven uh, again by the US government and, and NATO and the like, so it became a government internet. Most of you most probably don't know that the US government has stopped using IPs between uh, 1986 until 92. Okay, and they came back in 92 when Al Gore decided that IP should be the way to go. So they don't call it IP, they call it commercial off the ship. Okay, so that's why they say commercial, sorry, because I can buy routers uh, basically at a very low price because the uh, CNNP based routers, they were costing 10 times the price of an IP route. And then uh, we had new guys that wanted even to challenge uh, IPv6. So that's the WISIS, the IGF, and, and the ITU uh, without any protocol, but they were just chasing basically ICANN and also the registries you know, to, to become the sixth registry uh, on this uh, planet. So, so there was an attempt you know, to control the internet from a government perspective. Then we had also an, an interesting thing, which is work going on, uh, which is the ITU, and they wanted to create a phone based internet, so using the phone numbers that we have today. And this project is still going on within the ITU, within the ITU, uh, chasing basically the, the ITF as, as such. And the biggest one that uh, is running currently is called the Clean Slate Internet. Uh, in the US it's called Genie, and in Europe it's called Future Internet. The European Commission has spent about 3 billion euro uh, so far on Future Internet, and we have not seen anything uh, that is uh, a code, and it's running as well. Uh, so it's just, you know, fancy uh, slides. The only thing that came out of Genie is basically uh, OpenFlow. So that's a project that was done in Stanford uh, out of uh, the $10 million that the U.S. government has allocated to Genie. Then in the meantime, we have uh, new protocols. So this is uh, the fact that we have not been pushing V6 uh, uh, the way it should be. It gave space and time to others to bring in new solutions like CCN and ICN, they are chasing IP as well. And we have now a new one called New IP, uh, which is basically based on SD and NFV. So NFV is now under design by Etsy, but since the NFV design so far is way too late, so a new group has been formed through uh, 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 different outfits, especially the uh, ISPs and some vendors, and they wanted to create rather a uh, kind of interoperable NFV between the various players, and if it works, that will be the de facto standard. Okay? But nobody discusses IPv6 in this, in this place. Then, uh, then we have the latest one is called NGP, Next Generation Protocol. So some group is trying to see whether IP and IPv6 are going to be the best fit for 5G. So this group has just been started uh, a month ago. So, so when you don't promote your own technology, it gives space to others to come in and bring in new things. But so far, uh, we are safe in order to promote V6. So. Now, if we look at the wireless generations, we have also the famous five generations. So the 1G, 2G um, are non-IP. And when we started the V6 forum back in 99, 2GPP also started exactly in the same year. And we had the chance to visit them and explain to them there is a new protocol called IPv6 and they should adopt it because they were defining new, themselves a new packet technology for 3G. And you can imagine if we didn't convince them and by coincidence that IPv6 was there, your smartphones today will not be connected to the internet but to something else that we don't even know. So it's very good to uh, discuss with the other partners and then see where uh, we can put uh, effort into this. So, so I've been a board member of 3GPP since then so I'm watching that, that thing, and we have even uh, put an ITF, etc, uh, 3GPP, uh, RFC, which allows 3GPP to use the ITF RFCs without changing anything, which, which makes sense. If they start also messing around with ITF uh, standards, we'll have a little disaster. So, 
At the beginning, we specified IPv6 for IMS exclusively, because that made sense, and IMS is where the business model uh, exists. But uh, through the uh, spectrum uh, collapse that we had back in 2000, uh, basically most of the mobile operators had to pay billions of dollars in order to get spectrum. So they have delayed it and then went back to, to IPv4, and primarily to NAT, which was a really bad decision, but at least we had some IP in there. And then now we talk about, uh, uh, you know, carrier-grade NAT. Since when NAT is, you know, carrier-grade solution? So this is not an abnormality that we have. But in the meantime, 4G for, for especially in the US, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile and AT&T, they are at 50 plus percent traffic using IPv6. And the mobile devices are using IPv6 as well. Uh, this is where the dynamic in the U.S. is quite important, which is bringing this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this flow of uh, traffic to uh, V6. And currently there is a big design uh, of 5G around the world, so everyone is competing to be number one in this area. So a couple of protocols are under discussion like MAMO, uh, MIMO or MMWave, but the spectrum has not been yet defined. That would be only in 2019 through the ITU uh, discussion. You know, a recent discussion happened last September. There's one coming up in 2018 and then 2018. Maybe the world will agree on a harmonized spectrum usage for 5G. But 5G should not compete with 4G. 4G will, will be with us for, for a long time. 5G will have most probably to have focused places, especially in the verti vertical markets, uh, like in an enterprise uh, area where you take out all the cables and do everything through uh, wireless. So, so these are some, some of the scenarios that are going to be uh, of interest in the future. IoT generations, we have also three. So the first one, uh, IoT is non-IP. RFID was the first one. Uh, so Kevin Ashton you know, invented RFID at MIT. And uh, in one of the press conferences back in 99, 99 seems to be a good year for most of the new technologies. And in the press conference, he said, um, yeah, RFID is Internet of Things. Although RFID is not connected to the, to the Internet, and um, if I can get uh, the line here. Um, so, so, so we are still working on how to get RFID to be, con to be connected to the Internet. And that's something that you know, all of you should be Can you hear me? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so, so and uh, and gateways and 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 the, the beautiful model of peer-to-peer -peer or in this case end-to-end -end is fundamental uh, for IoT. So again, we are introducing gateways for uh, such a you know fantastic technology uh, in the future, and especially when you have zillions of devices that are, that are going to be connected. So, so we are now toiling in order to get uh, the next generation of IoT devices. So all the smartphones and smart sensors and smart actuators and so on will have an IPv6 stack in it. Uh, so, so there is uh, plenty of work to be done in the various S SDOs in order to convince them uh, that's the way to, to, to move forward. But there is always resistance, which is quite normal. It's uh, lack of knowledge. It's most probably they want to create their own market, their own place. And everyone is trying to have its uh, own uh, proprietary solutions in this area. Then we have the data generations. So the first one is all of this uh, kind of non-IP, uh, telex, fax, and so on and so forth that was with us. It's interesting to find that um, uh, one of the first disks that uh, was found back in 1906 in uh, Crete, and it's, uh, it's a disk out of um, you know, terracotta, and it was interesting, it was already about 3,000 years before, uh, uh, before Jesus, uh, and uh, the in encryption in it is the adoration of the mother of Crete. So, you know, the ladies, they had more, more power in the past, so we have taken away their, their power, so I think the ladies should get that same power back. But interesting, in that disk, it was written from outside to inside and on both sides. So the disk basically uh, concept existed 
it needs only time you know, to, to put it on, on some hard disk. Now, with big data today, uh, we have a problem with IPv6 because we have Hadoop and it has v4 embedded into it and they cannot use v6 as a matter of fact they have a script in order to disable ipv6 out of it so jordi if you have a bit of time to look into hadoop and make it work with v6 that would be a major contribution because it will have an impact on iot as well as on uh, <clears throat> on uh, on the data in the future as well so so uh, big data is uh, going to be a lot smaller than big iot data and uh, the big IoT data will be more important when you have the results instantly. So you cannot archive the, the, the data and then uh, try to exploit it. So it has to be while streaming the IoT data that you can make decisions right away. That will be most probably the, the biggest contribution that we can do in this area. So, so this is uh, something really we have to watch uh, because Hadoop is blocking uh, basically IPv6 in big, big data as such. That's why the big data guys, they say, you know, it's network layer, it's none of our concern. We shouldn't even look into it. So we have plenty of people that are trying to position themselves to be, you know, the drivers of, uh, you know, all of these kind of smart cities, uh, internet of uh, things, and the various sectors that are trying now to converge, you know, to, to create a, a harmonized uh, standards. And, and, and basically, you know, it's more important to see these uh, vertical markets that are uh, going to use internet technologies. Uh, so far, you know, they are using their own cables, it's proprietary networks. So the car industry, we see movements within Google and, and this and that. But in, in Germany, you have Industry 4, which is still not uh, willing to use IPv6. And, uh, and, I, and I think we have a, a great uh, uh, effort in you know, order to drive the V6 uh, philosophy into these people. So, so basically, this end-to-end uh, -end model is fundamental to anything we do in the future. And V6 enabled this, and this is very important that in this uh, region, we should look into making this happen as well. So when we look at uh, the overall uh, penetration V6, 10% is really a lot. And as a matter of fact, uh, we knew uh, right in the beginning, we were not naive, that it would take us at least a decade you know, to get V6 kicking off to 10%. Uh, because of the issues I mentioned to you, uh, you know, resistance from, uh, from a different players, especially outside of the internet community. But now we find the resistance within our internet community, so we have to even convince ourselves in order to move forward. But if I look at uh, uh, the uh, networks like Germany, basically V6 is almost done in that place. And the biggest driver is the US. Without the US, V6 would never happen. So it's, it's there. So we can, we can just take it for granted. We have to do it in this place as well. So comparing the, the core V4 to V6, we're almost there. Uh, so there is no, uh, you know, the past time we have spent on V6 has really paid off. And then um, it's not really the 10% of the worldwide, which is important. I remember back in 99, we had only 10% worldwide IPv4 penetration. That's all we had. We had about 300 million people using the internet. And today we have basically the same uh, number, but per country, if I look at uh, Germany or, or let's say Belgium, they have already 55% V6 adoption, which is amazing. And this is due to the core people that are driving it. Like Azael was saying, you need to have stakeholders in order to drive the technology in your country because they are the best practice in order to get you know, proper documentation about how we did it and who has done it and why should we interoperate and what is the success story and where is the business case and so on and so forth. And that work is really fundamental. And uh, not only the V6 world does it, every sector has its own forum in order to promote their technologies. So, so um, you know, you, you, want, you shouldn't be surprised that, uh, you know, Ecuador, Peru and uh, Brazil are, uh, are ahead of even many other countries in Europe. Uh, and obviously even, uh, uh, even uh, even uh, China, which normally should be among the, the very first one because the government pays for it. And uh, you shouldn't be surprised that the number one is from this area, the island of uh, St. Bartholomew. They have 100% percent achieved. So it's next door to you. So it's, it's not impossible. On top of that, you have, uh, as I mentioned, Ecuador, uh, uh, 
Peru and uh, Brazil. Uh, even Brazil has about 12 million people using V6 without even knowing it. So most of these people don't know that they are using V6. The beauty will be when they understand, especially the developers, that they have V6, that's a writable IPv6 uh, address, then I can start do peer peering with somebody else that has an IPv6 address. And then people will communicate between them. Today you can do that with V4, because none of you has an IPv4 at home, a writable one. Okay, so you don't have, you don't have that facility. That's a major, if not the best, uh, feature we can, we, we can get. As a matter of fact, you will not get one single IPv6 address. Billions, you can have them. You know, slash uh, uh, 48 or 56, you've got as much as the current internet address space. And that's very important for innovation, inventing new, uh, new, new uh, uh, applications. So if I look at the websites, 28% of the top 500 websites that drive basically 80% of the, tra the traffic around the world, they are already V6. So I, I didn't get any numbers from uh, this uh, part of the world. But uh, this uh, slide is to compare it to the next one, which is the NSAC. And the world is talking about the NSAC like mad. When you look at the adoption is 1.2%. 1.2%. That's absolutely peanuts for the value of this technology. All the banks are ignoring the NSX. As a matter of fact, in my view, the NSX is more important than IPv6. And so, so a lot of banks are getting hijacked and they have to refill the accounts because they don't want their people to be, to be upset or to find out that their bank is not, uh, uh, not uh, uh, protecting them. The, the other one is SIP. We talk about SIP for decades and the penetration is still very low. So I guess the various uh, task forces and fora and so on around the world are doing a very, very good job. So this uh, evolution, I want to go a bit in detail into this RFID. So in order to get uh, the layer one to be done, so we have approached, uh, we have created working groups within uh, I, uh, uh, IEEE and, and Comsoc because it has about 250,000 members and most of them are academia and so on. And the knowledge in that area is really missing when it comes to V6 because they are, you know, just link, just uh, basically uh, Ethernet oriented and, and, and uh, signaling oriented. So we wanted to add uh, our uh, uh, input into this area, especially IoT, SDNFA and, and 5G. So, so this, uh, Kevin, I invited him a couple of years ago to Luxembourg to do a presentation on, on, uh, on IoT. And he said, uh, look, you know, the big characters is the, are the easier things to do and the smaller ones are the toughest one. So when he thinks that IPv6 deployment is very easy to, to do, so this is how much uh, people are not really knowing the, the, these things, then low power would be very important. But I guess, uh, you know, new techniques like harvesting power. In this room, we can harvest enough power, you know, to, to uh, upload enough energy in your smartphones without any problem. So. So that's why you get nervous after a couple of hours. You have to take a coffee break. It's the various um, signals that you are, that you are getting, getting through your, uh, your bodies. So. so obviously, open data formats, so it's not yet done. It's difficult to send you know, data from different sensors. This all has to be done. And, and uh, the standard organization, they don't even talk to each other. And everyone has its own uh, uh, people, as I mentioned. Even things like co-op, normally you don't need co-op for IPv6. You can just use IPv6 directly. Because with co-op, you create not a gateway. But still, people are talking about it. You have to convince, in this case, Google or Microsoft to adopt it. It might take a couple of years you know, to, to achieve this. I don't think I need to go into these details. In the meantime, for instance, if you take the various IoT protocols, you can still uh, get them to communicate through IPv6 and even give each device an IPv6 address, even if it doesn't support IPv6. This is possible today. But you have to have a gateway, an IPv6 gateway. But this was, will facilitate the adoption of IPv6 when the customers see that I can communicate to these various different devices and I can manage them, then he will start asking for smarter devices to have an IPv6 packet. 
because that will be uh, IPv6 uh, uh, stack, because that will move the other organization to define the IPv6 stack into them. But the current uh, IoT, I would, I would say, is still dumb IoT that we have today. And we have still the confusion between consumer IoT and enterprise IoT. Consumer IoT will not be done by ISPs because they already have enough problems with connecting just IPv6 or IP even to each uh, house. Uh, they're not going to send you people and to install cameras in your house. That's just not in. So the only thing they can do today, since they cannot give you an IPv4 address, they will sell you a port uh, for your cameras. A port in Luxembourg costs one and a half dollars, one and a half euros a month. So, but I get IPv6 for free. So I have installed four cameras, and I have, you have V6 here. I checked it. I could look at my cameras over V6. Perfect, no problem, from here. So Cuba is, is uh, with this, uh, this demo, is already ahead of many other countries uh, to speak of. Cloud computing. This is an amazing story, invented by two, uh, uh, two, two experts from South Africa. So don't underestimate Africa. There are some people that are doing tremendous work. And they have uh, created this elastic compute cloud, uh, cloud computing, what they call EC2, uh, for the fact that being in South Africa, they couldn't get access to IP4 addresses. So they used one global one and then recycled it you know, to give the, uh, the impression that you have you know, routable IP4 addressing. And they were hired by Amazon. And that's the base of Amazon's current AWS worldwide. The only problem I have with this is that the current cloud computing uh, network is using a proprietary stack. And the proprietary stack has back doors. And if we have the internet and cloud that you have to pay for, and then you are putting you know, your private data, government data into the clouds, you basically lose data sovereignty. So anyone can look at your data from anywhere. So the only way to fix this is to go to move to the open stack to be used. Obviously, Amazon is not going to use that because it will just open the cloud computing market to them. So one of our tasks is really to promote open stack based on IPv6. That will give us the data sovereignty that you can make sure when you have, when you have an open source stack, the, res the security researchers will look at the stack and see what kind of backdoors are there. And they will be able to make sure that the data is not going to be uh, uh, going from one place to, the, to another one. And, and this is, this is one, one important thing. I, I do have a bit of an um, issue with cloud computing. So with robotics, we have killed many blue-collar jobs. And I fear that cloud computing is going to kill white-collar jobs. So we have to make sure that we are not going to do that mistake uh, you know, to send our best guys, you know, most of the IT guys are going to be without jobs. You have to recycle them into something else, which is not really a, a good thing to do. Just because Amazon had plenty of overcapacity and they want to use it, you know, to sell, to sell it to some other, other places. And now everyone is jumping on it and making IT professionals to be redundant like we have done it with, with the blue collar people. So, so when it comes to uh, uh, the various cloud computing, uh, uh, cloud uh, services. So you can see that the first one is Amazon. They don't want to do it at all. And I have some friends inside. They say they will never move to an open uh, stack. And some other, other companies are doing that, but they don't have the weight and the adoption uh, with the other guys. Going back to uh, 5G standardization, there are a lot of organizations moving uh, forward into this one. So, so basically, uh, the uh, ARI, the ITU, ITU does uh, what is called M uh, MIT 2020 and uh, created the 5G focus group uh, run primarily by Huawei, which is quite interesting. And you know, to define the requirements and then define the spectrum to be either below six gigahertz or over six gigahertz. But this is going to be a, a, a really a discussion among governments you know, to see which spectrum is going to be unified around the world so we don't have different uh, uh, radio uh, uh, technologies to be done. Otherwise, you will have multiple uh, modus uh, uh, in order to access these things. So. Then uh, I don't think I need to go through the requirements, and I don't have the time for this. 
just a small uh, KPI uh, comparison between 4G, which is in the middle, the dark one, and then 5G, which is around it. <clears throat> so there will be some uh, very important differences between the two in order to take, basically use the most important uh, uh, wireless uh, uh, field uh, into addressing uh, the sectors that have not yet adopted uh, wireless technologies and IP and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so in your uh, research or work, you have to look at these uh, KPIs and match your work with them. I don't think I need to go through this. This is just to give you, a, you know, a view of the rollout. So what you see LTE, this is also another issue we have with this uh, standard, standardization organization. 3GPP cannot call uh, uh, 4G LTE. So, because 3GPP is an organization. If you want to call it 4G, then you have to change it to 4, 4GPP. Then you have to create a new uh, outfit and you have to change the entire legal uh, uh, agreement between the various uh, partners around the world. That's why they avoid uh, calling the new protocols 4G. They'll call it LTE and LTE Advanced and LTE Pro and so forth. And even 5G was resisted for quite a while because it will, uh, again, endanger the creation of 3GPP as an organization. But it has a branding problem because anyone that's not participating in the SDOs can just go outside and say, hey, we have 4G. And the government say, oh yeah, 4G is better than 3G. So, and this is happening in the US and in some European countries that people are using this vacuum a branding definition in order to do this. But if you look at the LTE curve, it's gonna go way to 2040. So 5G has to have a real uh, business case and real technology uh, focus where it can, uh, can, can make it. <clears throat> and in our discussion, if I look at the hourglass, basically radio is just one little portion of the entire work. As a matter of fact, copper can deliver already gigabits uh, access and fiber even terabit. So the weakness we have is radio but it's the most formidable thing because it's easier to deploy. Although it's expensive, but easier to deploy. But there we still have, we are at 100 megabit per second. So what you want to have is to have fiber in the earth and fiber in the air. That should be 5G. But in this case, that will open a myriad of applications in, in the future. Uh, one word about uh, SDN. <clears throat> so we have, uh, you know, currently a debate about uh, what's the, what's the in, you know, how should SDN and NFV work. If I take as SDN and NFV, they need three things to work all the time. One, it has to be always on, so the network should never go down. And uh, second, it has to be secure, because SDN management and NFV management has to be done in a trusted environment. Then it has to scale. And the current work done by SDN and NFV is based on IPv4. So here we have to go and you know, promote the scalability to, to them. But when they hear about it, they say, yeah, this makes sense. But a lot of people do not go into this area, except you here in this room. The other SDUs, to them, it's none of their business. It's done by somebody else, huh? which is, a, which is a, a, an abnormal thing in one small earth where we have just the same people doing this work and they don't talk to each other. We are in, you know, in, a, in an era of uh, communication, but somehow we are blocked there. So I'll, I'll finish with this. So, so this is how it's gonna work, uh, in a, you know, pan out in the future. Radio access will be very important. Uh, V6 uh, will be mandated everywhere, if not only, because we don't want to have two internets, V4 based, primarily NAT based or CGN based, and V6, because the two of them, uh, you know, from a security point of view, they won't work. Now, we have not yet done any tests on this, and nobody has told us what kind of, you know, holes V4 and NAT are going to bring to V6, and vice versa. We don't have any specific study on this, primarily because we don't have enough uh, V6 security people. So it's either they're pro V6 or against V6, but some, nobody has a clearer judgment in this area. So, so the, so the, this is what Steve Ding has always been preaching, is we have to move from an hourglass into a champagne glass. And it will take time. Thank you very much.